Tonight's event, and tonight's speaker, whom I'll introduce in a minute, uh, is here as part of a workshop generously funded by the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute on uh, the subject of normativity and reasoning. And the workshop uh, has brought in people from a range of top universities around the world, including our partner campus, NYU in New York, as well as MIT, the Harvard Society of Fellows, Yale, the University of Chicago, University of California at Berkeley, Hebrew University, Stanford, Syracuse, the University of Pittsburgh, the University of Edinburgh, and Brown University. And if I forgot any of those, I apologize. Uh, tonight's speaker is Professor Jeffrey Sayer McCord. He is the... <clears throat> Moorhead Kane, Alumni Distinguished Professor of Philosophy at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Professor Sarah McCord received his BA from Oberlin College in Ohio and his PhD from the University of Pittsburgh. In addition to being the recipient of numerous honors and awards, he has published an array of books and articles on topics in ethics, meta-ethics, and the moral philosophy of the Scottish Enlightenment. And tonight, Professor Sarah McCord will be talking to us about evolution and rational agency. So please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Sarah McCord. Climate ethologists have for a long time uh, documented the behavior of various primate groups. And among their interests have been to try to figure out the, whether they can find manifestations of distinctively moral capacities for kindness, for bravery, most frequently and famously for altruism. And there's a long history of primate ethologists trying first to document cases that would count as genuine altruistic behavior, and then to figure out why the capacity for altruism, for acting in, a, in ways that are predictably bad for you, uh, might have evolved in an evolutionary context and then been sustained once they had developed. Most recently, though, primate ethologists have moved from the study of what they take to be potentially quite hardwired capacities. Say the capacity for altruism might evolve because of kin selection or group selection, um, or there might be instances of the capacity for reciprocal altruism. All of these seem to be uh, mechanisms that might explain the emergence and sustaining of genes that lead to behavior that we recognize as altruistic. But in doing so, they seem to be fairly hardwired. Uh, and so what primate ethologists have been interested in is more, most recently, more plastic capacities. In particular, the capacity that we manifest to adjust our behavior according to the norms in force in different contexts. So there have been some lovely studies that have established pretty conclusively that uh, bonobos, for instance, and chimpanzees have this capacity. You can adjust their context so that in one context, one form of behavior is what seems to be the accepted form of showing deference, and then move individuals from that context to a different context, and they'll quickly adjust their behaviors much as we do when we're driving in different countries and we switch which side of the road we drive on or we adjust the speed at which we go according to the speed limit. This is a pretty sophisticated capacity. Interestingly, and in a way that puzzled me, a lot of the primate ethologists take evidence for the presence of this capacity and celebrate it as the core and most fundamentally important new story of the evolutionary roots of morality. What puzzled me a little bit about that was there's another capacity, a morally important capacity it seems to me, that they tend to run together with the capacity to govern yourself by norms that you recognize or enforce. That's the capacity to do what you're doing, to conform or violate when you do because you think it's right or justified, or your duty. So what I want to keep separate for the sake of this paper is the capacity on recognizing there's a norm in force to conform to it, or even the internalization of a norm in force that leads you to act according to the norm, on the one hand, and the other capacity to 
whether there's a norm in force or not to comply or violate, to act one way or another, according to your recognition of so acting as, and now I purposely use a bunch of different terms, good, justified, your duty, the right thing to do. I think it's an important trait that we have that we're able to do that. So we're able, when the laws say one thing, we're able to decide to conform to the laws because it's the right thing to do, or under, the con under a context of some laws, decide it would be wrong to conform and succeed in breaking the law in the name of what we think is right or good or justified. Now, this capacity is a capacity that was valorized by Immanuel Kant as being a rational agent. And I'll go to Kant in a minute to uh, try to tease out what he had in mind by this capacity. Um, but I want to flag something Kant thought that I'm not buying into. Kant thought having and exercising this capacity was the be all and end all of having moral worth. That any being that didn't have it didn't have moral worth and that it was only in exercising this capacity that you had in your actions moral worth. I'm not buying on, into that for the sake of this paper. I'm more than happy, I actually believe, a great deal of morally worthy behavior is unmediated by reflections on whether it's good or right or justified to do what you're doing. On the other hand, I think we are able to so reflect and we're able not just to reflect in the course of considering our own options, we reflect on each other and on possible institutions and on future trajectories for our children. Thinking of those things, thinking of how we might raise them, thinking of what rules we might enforce or institutions we might build, we think about which ones would have the result of leading people to do what's right or justified or good, thereby acting ourselves, if we succeed after reflection and acting, acting ourselves on the very kind of thoughts that I'm interested in. So I'm going to label the kind of thoughts, the thought that something's good, that it's right, that it's justified, that it's your duty, as normative thoughts. And the capacity I want to focus on is the capacity to act on the basis of one's normative thoughts. That's the capacity Kant characterized as rational agency. And in the end, I'm interested in what the evolutionary story might be of the emergence of such a capacity. But for the sake of today's talk and the fairly restricted length of time, he said 40 minutes, not plus or minus an hour, whereas I normally use the plus or minus an hour part. Um, we're not really going to get to that positive story, except I'm going to tip my hat with an optimistic view. Uh, at the very end. What I really want to do is have you with me wrestle with the question, what kind of evidence would you need to credit some tribe of people you might meet, some members of another culture, undergraduates you meet, with the capacity genuinely to be wondering about what they might do, is this good or right or justified, as opposed to just wondering, will my parents approve of it? Will I get in trouble if I do it? That's the distinction I'm interested in, and I'm interested in what kind of evidence we would need to be justified in attributing to individuals or groups that capacity. Before I move to Kant, the last thing I want to mention is the very same capacity seems to me important not just in morality, albeit not the be-all and end-all of morality. It's important also in other practical contexts where Ethics is not at issue, but you're trying to figure out what the best thing to do, what the best course would be, what the best career would be, what the best way to decide on what movie to see would be. In each of those cases, we have the capacity to wonder about the options, not just what do I most want, but what's most worth doing, what would be justified. And outside of practical context, theoretically, we often regularly form beliefs presumably quite reliably in ways that lead us to be justified without wondering about our beliefs, are they justified or not? But we have the capacity to step back from our beliefs and ask of the ones we find themselves, ourselves with, are these justified? 
Are these the right beliefs to have? Is it valuable for me to have this belief? So the kind of capacity I'm thinking of is not restricted to morality. Um, it's a general capacity to reflect on options, asking of them in normative terms about their value or their justification or their rightness. Now, as I said, Kant thought that, let me just move on. Kant thought this capacity was at the center of morality, and he characterizes rational agency, and he very briefly, in what's called the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, characterized the capacity mainly by contrast, and he put it this way. Everything in nature acts according to laws, but only rational agents act according to their conception of a law. That is, their representation of something as good or practically necessary. He went on, in a way we won't explore now, to distinguish between perfectly rational agents who straight away on representing something as good or right or practically necessary acted accordingly, and dependent beings like us who always have the possibility of failing to do say because of our inclinations, what we think is good or right or justified. And he goes on to say of people like us, of human beings who are subject to inclination and temptation that may lead us to act irrationally, he thinks of us that we're subject to imperatives, a kind of demand of our own will that he divided into, imper into uh, hypothetical and categorical imperatives. I'm just going to leave all that aside and go back to the capacity, the capacity to act on your representation of something as practically necessary or good. And I'm going to try to figure out what that capacity is and when we should attribute it to someone. That's the target. Now, to go at the target, I want to go by way of successive approximations. So, on Kant's view, everything in nature acts according to laws. Only rational agents act according to their representation of a law or a representation of something is practically necessary. So the first thing to notice is that group, rational agents, are within the very tiny subset of everything in nature, the tiny subset that represents. Okay? We're all capable of representing. Dogs and cats can represent. Photographs can represent, books represent, IDs in your wallet represent, tons of things can represent. Not all of them have the capacity to act on the basis of their representations. Rational agents can act on their representation of something as good or right, so they're in the subset of things that can represent, the even tinier subset, those things that can act on the basis of their representations. With me so far? Okay. Now what I want to do is describe to you various things that agents that have the capacity to act on the basis of their representations, most of which count in various contexts according to various views as acting rationally. But they all, as I describe them, fall short of the target of what Kant thought we should be interested in. So I'm going to start with something that doesn't really count by anyone's lights as a rational agent. This is what I call a stimulus response agent. You can imagine something. In the States, we have a Roomba robot that travels around your room and vacuums, and you can set up various bar barriers to keep it from going down the steps. And it seems to represent its environment in ways that it responds to, especially when it runs across these electronic barriers. As soon as it detects them, it changes direction. Or you can buy Lego kits where you build into the Lego toys various sensors, and then you can program them in light of their sensors to respond in various ways to what they represent to be in their environment. So these are things that you might think of as representing the world as being a certain way, the light being red, the barrier being in front of me, things like that, and respond accordingly, straight away. Call those stimulus response agents. We're stimulus response agents in many contexts. Something happens and we jump back in fear 
or up in excitement or forward in hope. Responding straight away on the representation with our behavior. So let me complicate these agents. Imagine there are agents who are able not merely to represent the world as being a certain way. They represent the world as being such that it would be one way rather than another thanks to its own intervention. So they're not just responding as to a stimulus. They've got quite complex capacity to think of possibilities that are realizable through their own intervention. Okay? If you imagine a creature like that who responds to the prospects differentially in light of what it's most attracted to, you have a creature that is perfectly modeled by rational decision theory in economics. If you identify the differential attractions with the strength of the preferences of the agent. Call these strategic agents. No, I'm sorry, I've got the wrong label, planning agents. So they see the possible futures, they plan to pursue one or another, they follow a path as a result. Which path they follow, they follow as a result of what's most attractive to them. If they do that, they're rational by standard uh, decision theory as used in economics, but notice that they might do that without ever asking of any of the options which one is better than the other. And they might do it without wondering about any path to the most attractive options. Which path is right or justified or forbidden? All you need to have one of these planning agents is an agent who can represent the future, be differentially attracted, and act according to the strength of the attractions. So whether rational or not, in some sense, not yet a rational agent in the sense that um, I'm interested in trying to understand. So let's complicate them even more. Imagine these planning agents not only see future prospects available as a result of their own intervention, they recognize they're in an environment where there are others like them. So they now represent themselves as interacting with others that act on the basis of their representations, that then shift the options available to them. So for the first time, cooperation is possible because now you can, in order to bring about an outcome you're attracted to, get someone else who you know will be attracted to helping, if only they think something, to get them to think the thing that will get them to cooperate with you. And lying becomes possible because it won't always be the case that the thing you're most attracted to bringing about, thanks to them doing something, involves them holding a belief that you think is true. Okay? It may be that what will bring about the most attractive option is them falsely believing you'll be there to help them tomorrow if only they'll help you today. Game theory is the theory of what standards conformity to which constitute rational interactions in such a context for such agents. And there are various theories about what the rational thing to do. Should you tit for tat? That is, should you, if, you, if uh, another agent lies to you, lie back, if they violate an agreement, violate agreements? There are all sorts of debates about what the right standards are. But notice you could be this kind of agent, a strategic agent, hugely sophisticatedly thinking about not just the options available to her through her loan behavior, but the options she could make possible by getting other people to represent their worlds in certain ways and thus act according to their representations. Notice that strategic agents who will count as game theoretically rational if their behavior conforms to whatever the right norms are, might engage in that behavior without ever raising the question about the outcomes they're pursuing, are these worth pursuing, or the means they propose to take, are these justified, right, or acceptable ways to interact with others. So you can have hugely sophisticated strategic agents acting in an environment of other strategic agents, successfully pursuing what they most desire, and never raising the question of what they most desire or how they're attracted to pursuing it, are the ends good, are the means acceptable? 
So they don't yet need to have the capacity we're interested in to count as rational agents in the game theoretic sense. So let's complicate them some more. Suppose you have creatures who are sociologically sophisticated so that they pick up that there are norms in force in their environment, so that there are options available to them thanks to getting others to conform to the norm or violate the norm. So you can get your friends in trouble by telling them the speed limit is higher than it is if you like having that kind of fun with your friends. This is the malevolent part of me coming out. Or you can, in knowing that certain norms are in force, curry favor by conforming to them. Do it publicly so others see, so that others trust you, so that you have new options that you wouldn't have had otherwise. So you can be norm perceptive and then act in according to your representation of the norms in force, which is what they have good evidence bonobos and chimpanzees do in a quite sophisticated way. They're very subtle norms. They're very quick to pick them up. They're very quick to understand what the behaviors are that count as conforming to the new norms. But you can do that all without thinking of the norms or thinking of the compliance with the norms as good or right or justified. All you need to do is be attracted to the prospects that come with conformity or violation. Now, we can complicate them a little bit more. The case I was sort of inviting you to imagine is a case where the attractions and aversions are all due to the prospect of consequences that come from compliance or violation. So it's the punishments or rewards in prospect that might lead someone who is norm perceptive to adjust her behavior accordingly. And indeed, it looks like in a lot of contexts, a lot of our behavior is very sensitive. In the states, speed limits are routinely violated unless people believe there's a serious chance they'll get caught and given a speed limit. So you get people where it seems plausible to think of them, their behavior conforming with this norm is highly sensitive to their beliefs about the prospect of punishment or reward. You can imagine creatures who, in whatever way, and we obviously, we have this capacity, internalize the norms and comply with the norms they've internalized. I want to emphasize, though, that even such creatures, so we have stimulus response agents who are also planning agents, who are also strategic agents, who are also norm sensitive perceptive agents who are norm governed, who are governed by norms they've internalized. You can have beings like that, who in conforming to the norms they've internalized, nonetheless don't think of conformity as good or right or justified. The most vivid case for me is a former teacher of mine, a, a very famous philosopher named Karl Hempel, who uh, was, grew up in Germany and at the time he was my professor, we were in Pittsburgh, and we were in a building that was about to be destroyed. And the whole department, graduate students and faculty, decided to throw a big party. And as part of the party, someone started writing on the walls. And so we had a bunch of sort of stupid intellectual graffiti all over the walls, but it was part of celebrating the end of this old building and the new department. And it wasn't defacing property that anybody cared about. And Hempel clearly wanted to participate, clearly thought there was nothing wrong with anything we're doing, picked up a pen, went to a wall, and could not bring himself to write on the wall. He had so successfully, it had so successfully been accomplished that he'd internalized the norm that he couldn't get himself to violate it, even in a context where he made clear he didn't think violating the norm was wrong or unjustified or bad. Any of those things. He just was in the grip of a norm without having the thought complying with it is good or right or justified. Now, I know that partly because I credit him with the concepts and his explicit acknowledgement that there was nothing wrong or unjustified about violating the norms. So um, what I'm looking for against that background is what would you have to know of a group of primates 
or a group of human beings that you otherwise hadn't known before, of them, oh, they're thinking in complying with this norm that it would be wrong not to comply or that it's justified to comply or that the right thing to do is com to comply or that it's their duty to comply. I'm purposely tossing out different possibilities because I think the puzzle is about this whole range of thoughts. What would it take, what kind of evidence do we need to reasonably attribute to others the capacity to think in normative terms? Now, against that background, I just want to play a little video for you. Vulcan quickly offers the tool. He must hope Virgil is smart enough to open the lid and fair enough to cut him in on the spoils. There, fair enough. Is that what he's worried about here? Why think that? Virgil is struggling. He doesn't have his friend's skill. And Vulcan is getting impatient. Familiar feeling. The flint is finally through the lid, but can Virgil be trusted to share the nuts? With Vulcan out of reach, it must be tempting to take the lot. Three nuts, a fair share. Vulcan and Virgil have used teamwork to beat the system. But can Capuchins really have a sense of fair play? Now let me pause it for a second. Ted gives if I can. a white chip. So it's one thing to ask in a, whether they have a sense of fair play in to be asking, do they comply with a norm that has them divide things up fairly? It's another thing, and it comes out more as this goes on, are they thinking about the way of dividing things, this is fair or unfair? And something helpful to keep in mind in this context, for all of those, those of you who have kids, you, uh, it, at least if fairness is one of the terms of trade in your family, there's a stage where when they're unhappy with an outcome, no matter what, they cl complain, saying it's unfair. That's just the way they express dissatisfaction. And it doesn't seem right, at least in my experience, to credit them with the concept of fairness at that point. One of the striking things is how quick the transition is to where even if you don't agree with why they think something's unfair, to thinking, oh, now we're arguing about fairness. Now we're discussing whether it would be fair or not. I'm interested in that transition. What is it that the kids who make the transition, those of us who've made the transition, what have we acquired and what's the evidence for that? It can be exchanged for food, in this case, a dried biscuit. Very happy with it so far. An identical token for Virgil, but in return, he gets a juicy grape, a far better exchange. Virgil is back for seconds, but this time Vulcan sees him get the grape. He now expects one too. Biscuit? That's not fair. Is the thought, that's not fair, or I want one? Another grape. Vulcan is losing his composure. This injustice is too much. He was happy with Biscuit, but that was before Virgil got grapes. Now he'd sooner have nothing than be short-changed. It's a point of principle. What do 
I have to do? I'm licking it. <laughs> Virgil returns, so Vodka suspects Ted of readying another grape. It must be in there somewhere. At last, a succulent grape. <laughs> Unfair, that's unjust, it's a matter of principle. These are the kind of thoughts I'm interested in, what the evidence is that, in this case, he's thinking in those terms. What kind of evidence would you need for that? When are we not just over-anthropomorphizing? When are we properly crediting? So that was the case. Just to make, give you a couple of examples that are instances where primate ethologists are tempted very quickly to go from situations where manifestly people aren't ha people. Chimpanzees are not happy with the results and maybe just see a strategy for getting results they'll be happier with to crediting them with normative thoughts. So the question is, for our planning agents, our strategic agents, our norm-perceptive agents, our norm-governed agents, our norm-internalized agents, maybe for, for the chimpanzees, but maybe they already have the concept, what more is needed? I've tried to set it up so that there's a simple, obvious answer in one sense. So these are all agents that act on the basis of their representations. In each case, I've highlighted that they might be doing it without thinking of their options or the means to pursuing their options, that they're right or good or justified or permissible. What's missing? That kind of thought. And that's all you need, because once an agent has that kind of thought, she has the capacity to act on the basis of that kind of thought, as I've tried to structure the successive approximations. So the question now, a little bit more focused, is when should you attribute to someone that kind of thought? And there are two standard strategies for answering this, neither of which seems adequate. They correspond to long-running traditions in metaethics. One is usually called cognitivism, the other is usually called non-cognitivism. The labels don't matter. The issue is, if you think of each of the two strategies, they fall short, what's the right strategy? What's the way to tweak them or add to them or replace them such that if you follow that strategy, you'll have a good way of thinking about when you should credit others with normative concepts? That's my problem, really. So let me just run through the two common strategies. The first common strategy takes its inspiration from a parallel question, familiar question, when should you translate somebody's word, say, ug, into our word, blue? The thought is, is that my computer? Okay. The thought is, the way you do that, the way you figure out whether to credit others with the concept expressed by their term that you use blue to express, involves relying on our own competence with the concept in question, figuring out what in their environment satisfies that concept. So going and seeing what's blue in their environment, and then seeing whether they have a representation that's appropriately sensitive to the evidence available to them that something meets your concept. That is, there's something blue in their environment. Now it's important, you don't want to check to see whether they call UG all and only the things you would count as blue. Because it's possible to have a concept and to get wrong which things are which color often. So what you want to be sensitive to in figuring out whether they mean by UG blue, whether they're expressing the concept of blueness, you want to see whether their use of, their competent use of that term is sensitive to the evidence available to them that there's something blue in their environment. 
They also often might be in an environment where there's misleading evidence. So they'll count as UG things that aren't actually blue. Okay. And they'll fail to count as UG things that are blue. But if they're expressing their competence with the concept, it's only when they have misleading evidence. That's the general idea. Just swap in now the concept that's interesting you. Maybe you're interested in the concept of duty, or of justification, or of value, or of rightness. This idea is take that concept, figure out what in their environment is right, or is their duty, or is justified, and see whether by their use of the term, they're expressing a concept that's sensitive in its application to the evidence available to them that things are their duty or right or justified, whatever you're interested in. That's the general strategy. So you rely on co your competence with the concept, figure out what would be evidence for them that it's satisfied, and then see if they have a concept appropriately sensitive to that evidence. Now, one way to worry about this whole strategy is in focusing on whether they're sensitive to the, uh, sensitive to the evidence available to them that they're around something blue or around something good or justified, is that you might worry that the very analogy with blueness, or we could have substituted squareness or Aston Martin or Ducati or any concept that you might be interested in wondering, do they share the concept? A worry is that they might have a concept that refers to the very same thing. They might be thinking of what's good, but they might not be thinking of what's good that it's good. That is, they may not be using a normative concept in thinking about it. A way to bring this out is there's a fairly popular account of what value is, according to which something is genuinely valuable if and only if it would garner approval from someone properly situated. I don't believe this view. I don't suggest you believe this view, but pretend for a minute that that articulated the concept of value that you're competent with. And so you went into an environment and you tried to figure out whether people in that group had a term that expressed a concept that was sensitive to evidence that something would garner approval of the big guy. And suppose you found they did. Notice that you have two interpretations available of what they mean by their word, let's say their word is good. They might mean by good just approved by big guy. Or they might mean, as you mean, good. Those seem to be different. If what they're doing, they're doing only because big guy will approve of it and they would stop otherwise, they're just governed by that, the temptation is to think then that even if they're thinking of what is in fact good, they're just thinking of it in dispositional terms. They're just attributing it the property of being able to cause big guy to approve of it. And that's not the same as thinking of it that it's good, even if that's what makes it good. Okay, okay. So, Against this background, you've faced this kind of uh, interpretive ambiguity that trades on the fact that you don't yet know of the concept they're using that's tracking what's valuable or what's right or what's their duty, that in tracking it with that concept, that concept is a normative concept. So the second approach that's been popular is to say, oh, I know what the problem is. It's a, the problem is to figure out what it takes for a concept to be a normative concept. So instead of deploying our concept, say, of value and figuring out whether they have a concept that tracks value, we should deploy our concept of a normative concept and see whether the concept with which they're tracking value is itself a normative concept. This gets tricky because the notion of a normative concept, that's my label for all those terms that I tossed out and said these as a class are interesting together, is a term of art. It's not well worked out. Exactly what it takes for a concept to be a normative concept is something people are fighting about now, and it's really what I'm interested in. So I'm 
pushing you more and more into my corner of puzzlement. Here's one popular answer. What it takes for a concept to be a normative concept is for it to play a certain motivational role in the psychology of the person who has the concept. Right? So the trick for disambiguating just thinking, oh, big guy approves of it, and thinking it's good, is that the concept expressed by their good is a concept that when they think it's satisfied, motivates them. Now, if I've set things up right, you should already have pretty compelling reason for thinking, put that simply, that's got to be wrong. Because remember, stimulus response agents do that. They have representations of the world that are motivationally effective, as do planning agents and strategic agents and norm-governed agents and agents who've internalized norms. They're all creatures who have representations that are motivationally effective. So whatever you need to do, just declaring it's the motivational effectiveness doesn't get at it properly. So the challenge is, while thinking about what it takes for a concept to count as a normative concept, to pin down the features it takes, recognizing that simply referring to something that we pick out with a normative concept isn't enough, that's the first path and recognizing that it's being something simply that we happen to care about isn't enough. If you were with me in thinking stimulus response agents could be stimulus response agents without having a normative thought in their heads. Now, in a longer paper, I would go on and spell out my solution, such as it is, to this. Um, but we don't have time. Um, there is actually a paper on my website where I try to uh, nail down how to pursue the second strategy in conjunction with the first successfully. And the discussion starts with that dispositional account and a common worry, which is it can't poss I'm just about to finish. It can't possibly be right that merely garnering approval from the big guy is enough to be in a position to count what garners the approval is good. There's a common objection to this, which is, at the very least, the approval garnered has to be merited. If you're not in a position to think what gets the big guy's approval merits the big guy's approval, then the account can't get off the ground. Most people think that shows the account has to be wrong because it has to import a different theory of what it counts to merit approval. I actually think that criticism fails, but what's interesting is the criticism, that is, I think the criticism doesn't show the dispositional account is false. What it rightly shows is there's an extra constraint on normative concepts that we have to figure out. And the way to figure it out is to figure out why it's right to demand of what garners approval that it merits it, if you're a dispositional theorist. But it should be an account that works even if you think dispositional theories are wrong. And that's what I try to develop in the paper. I love his look. We're all the great carnivores. So, I don't have time to fill out. <laughs> I don't have time to fill out that story, but the thought is if you're going to give an evolutionary story of the emergence of the capacity I've been flailing around to try to identify, um, a hopeful prospect is that once you get your hands on what that capacity is, there are reason to think, there's reasons to think of its exercise that it's advantageous in various ways. That it gives you strategies to beat other animals or to cooperate together where you adjust your ends, not simply in light of what you happen to want, but in light of a kind of public reflection that allows for an adjustment that then if we have the capacity, allows us to adjust our behavior in light of the results of the deliberation. What would be the obvious
biological advantage of some of the things you were talking about earlier. So if you go back to the capuchin monkeys, if they actually were thinking this isn't fair, what would be the advantage there? Um, well, I suspect that the most plausible story has to do with the uh, possibility of shareable deliberation. That uh, if you're going to tell this evolutionary story, the real advantage is when we can move to reflecting not just on what we happen to want, but what we should want in terms that we can make public to others. And so I suspect with the Capuchins, they don't have that potential advantage, which makes me suspicious that there would be an evolutionary story of the capacity to reflect in that way. Though I think there is an evolutionary story of uh, the sense of fairness. So I think there are all, all sorts of benefits of that. I just don't see any reason to think it's mediated by the capacity to reflect on what's fair. Um, does that help as a partial answer? I'm, I went into philosophy because it's a fact-free enterprise. <laughs> and so my real interest here is to try to figure out what our idea of that capacity is and what would be interesting, fun ways to test for it. Um, so that's been my focus more than the real evolutionary story. But it could piggyback on a group selection story or a kin selection story or any number of others. But you have to find the advantage. And I think that comes in the social context. I just, uh, and as a student of philosophy, I'm wondering why Kant, uh, if there's something in particular that drew you to Kant, or this question in particular, if there's another philosopher that I might apply to. I mean, I was just thinking, to give you a sense of it, I was thinking of Heidegger uh, and, and his idea of, you know, I guess you could say ethics being situated in, in where you are and how you perceive the world. And instead, you're proposing something of more neutral rationality. I don't know if that's ascribing too much to Kant, but if you see where I'm coming from. So, I think I could have gone to any number of figures. Uh, I think if you read the, one way to read the Republic, for instance, where the question is, why be moral, why be a just person, and then there's a long discussion to the effect that being a just person, this is before you say why it's valuable, is a matter of being able to ask, answer, and act on the question, this is being ruled by reason, what's worth doing? And then he argues in Book Nine that this capacity is so valuable because it's only if you exercise it that you're genuinely free. That if you're not able to, a to a ask, answer, and then act on the question, what's worth doing, you're just at the hands of all sorts of forces and not your own commander. That's his idea. I could have gone to the Republic and said his very conception of a just person is a conception of someone with this capacity. But I pick Kant partly because he's so cryptic about this capacity he thinks is so central and so antithetical in most people's minds to anything like an evolutionary story of the emergence of a capacity, so non-naturalistic, that it's kind of a nice hook. But I think you know, Hume wrestles with this when he tries to explain the emergence of the capacity to do your duty because it's your duty, not out of some further motive. Um, so I think it's a commonly recognized capacity, differently valorized, sometimes ridiculed. You know, you could, you could think we're overthinking everything. If we just gave in to nature and got rid of this, these concepts, we'd be better off. Nietzsche certainly thinks that of the range of concepts he thinks we've inherited, um, even though he tries to then piggyback on them to introduce new concepts that do better. So, so there are sort of two questions we might have. One is uh, what's involved in having this capacity, and the other is what would we have to see to attribute right. it to someone or something? Um, and they're related in that we might learn something about what's involved in having the capacity by sort of paying attention to what we have to see in order to attribute it to mm -hmm. someone. But as you, as the video, as you pointed out through the video, we might be tempted to attribute it even in cases where there's no real th reason to think that it's there. So uh, we have to be careful about that. But I've just been trying to think about that question about attribution. Right. What would I have to see I think it would take more than what we saw in the video, but what more would it take? 
And you talked about kids and seeing kids make that transition. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about what you saw in kids making that transition. And without having thought about it very carefully, I thought that maybe something like reactive attitudes would be helpful. You know, if, if you see signs of guilt, not just of hiding what they're doing because they think they're going to get punished, but even when the threat of punishment isn't there, feeling, I don't know, something like that, or maybe resentment against others when their own good isn't at stake, or something like that right. might play that role, but I don't know. I've, so I think that's a natural good place to go to enrich the um, non-cognitivist approach. So, you know, try to say, oh, well, what we have to add are various reactive attitudes. I think Adam Smith in Theory of Moral Sentiments does a lovely but hugely ignored job of this. Um, one of the challenges is to figure out what counts as a manifestation of guilt as opposed to anger or anger at oneself or, and it looks like the easiest, fastest way to identify it just begs the question. It's guilt is when it's not misfiring, you know, a reaction to the thought you did something wrong and then we're back in the problem. Um, but I do think going in that direction is the right move. So I'm, a way to describe my overall sense of this is I think the cognitivist approach is exactly right in the most general view, which is you have to find signs of appropriate sensitivity to the evidence available to them. And you should identify a concept as the kind of thing, the deployment of which is sensitive to evidence but they standardly way underplay what counts as relevant evidence and um, appropriate responses to the availability of relevant evidence. That's where I think the non-cognivists are right. I think the kind of thing you need to see with a kid, the most accessible thing, is to see, start seeing what they offer as evidence and how they respond to counterarguments. Now, the responding to counterarguments isn't always the capitulating to them. But if they take a view that it was unfair because it was uneven, and you say, yeah, it was uneven, but he's older, and, and you're thinking, so bigger, so needs more food, and your kid responds, but that's bigger's nothing. You know, it's just because he was born first and you fed him more in the first place. Okay. Even if you don't think that's a good argument, the appropriate response is the sign that, okay, now they're in the, in the game of mobilizing a normative concept. Um, and I think guilt is one of the appropriate ways to respond to, to the evidence, and action is one of the appropriate ways. So I think if you find people mouthing it's unfair but not acting to oppose it, that's reason to suspect maybe they, don't, they aren't deploying unfair as a normative concept. None of this is conclusive. But once you enrich the evidential pool and ask, so what's that evidence of? I think it's, that's the right way to think about it. But I think it's a cognitivist way, not a non-cognitivist way. I'm certainly not a philosopher, so this is not going in that way. But if the, if the idea is, this seems to me to be somewhat like social consciousness, these normative skills and my question is do you think that they're all learned or do you think that there's a innate or genetic aspect to this or what's your take on that i So I don't, I'm hearing a version of the nature-nurture style question here. And um, when I think about that, because of what my, how my mom thought about it, I, as it happens, um, I immediately go to flowers and they're thriving and realize that whatever the genetics of flowers, if they're in your home and they're not well taken care of, they, they die. And so even the most non-social of things, stories of whether they thrive or not can depend on environment in all sorts of crucial ways, even social environment if they're in your house. Similarly, I, I don't have a way of dividing up the capacity. I do think of various people 
and dogs and cats, though cats enjoy disdain, and I don't know whether that uh, involves a normative concept or not. But in general, I think they are not capable of it. Um, and I think they're people who are not capable of it. Uh, I think psychopaths are not capable of it. Um, but I think there are a lot of, and so you, probably there's a genetic story there. And then you say, but that you would be capable of developing them doesn't mean you're going to develop them because I think you can be, there are plenty of human beings who don't have them who I think could have had them. So in a way, you might think, well, the reactive attitudes aren't generally going to be necessary or, or helpful because the general notion of justification surely applies to many cases where there's nice. nothing about wrong or being wronged and so on. Uh, so the general, so, and which is partly to say that uh, you know, there are other tapes we, one could have run, I suppose, where what's at issue is nothing about cooperation or a sense of fairness or justice, but just, you know, being able to uh, pass up the extra bonbon or something like that that Austin talked about. That is right. judging, you know, wanting to do A, but judging that it would be better to do B, better just for myself, let's right. say. But, but going back to what Julie was saying about the case of injustice or wrong, you might think that well, there are certain manifestations, standard manifestations of guilt uh, through which you can at least get some indication of whether it's present that where you don't have to sort of already assume the presence uh, the of person the person has the concept. So there are things like, you know, confession, trying to make amends, and so on. And there's an interesting difference between the kind of, let's say, um, resentment, primitive resentment, let's say, that a capuchin monkey, we might attribute to the capuchin monkey who feels stiffed, right, uh, wanting to get back. Uh, you could, you know, see right. it a little bit back, uh, where it's something like retaliation versus... Uh, something that could be mitigated by the other person's feeling guilt. And it turns out that there's a fair bit of empirical evidence that uh, when people have been wronged, they're as often more satisfied by the other person, by the knowledge that the other person feels badly about it, feels guilt about it. Of course, there's also the issue of apology. Or, but we right. want to distinguish between apology as just placating and apology as a genuine expression of guilt, but it seems to me th there are some behavioral indications there that you know one can work with. Absolutely. So I think just to reiterate the, the first point that if we're trying to capture the broad range of normative yeah. concepts, a lot of them seem to not be tied up with guilt and resentment, the, both in the practical case and the epistemic case. Even when you decide you formed an unjustified belief, that's often not accompanied by guilt depending on why you form the belief. I mean, it might be an expression of prejudice or irresponsible inattention, but it's the first point. I absolutely agree with that. Second point is, but in the case where we're thinking of contexts where guilt and resentment have a place, there is evidence besides jumping, as I sort of inappropriately implied, to the attribution of the belief again, evidence that there might be guilt or resentment in play uh, before you're prepared to say, well, yes, it turns out it really is guilt because it's tied to this idea. Uh, I think that's right, too. I, um, and I want to just highlight the important point that there's a, in that identification, what, what you did with resentment, which I think is really important, is say that, well, the right kind of resentment may be the kind of thing that gets placated in certain ways that it depends on a sensitivity to sincere making of amends. Um, that, I, I took it that's the idea that, you know, it's sort of the brute anger and revenge that the Capuchin feels, you might say, um, isn't sufficiently sensitive to certain things to see it as bound up with a normative concept. But if it recedes in the face of evident sincere apology or making amends, that starts to look like evidence that it was you know, tied to thinking you had been wronged right. as opposed to just done bad by. Right. Actually, maybe you, I think you might know this. I have a paper on uh, arguing that 
punishment, criminal justice, in criminal justice context is generally much less justified than people think, and a system of reparations is more justified. And part of the argument is the recognition that there are other ways to address justified anger other than inflicting pain on the person that you're angry, that you're angry with. That the desire for revenge can be addressed not by satisfaction, but by systems of amends. And I think that's a, a, a morally very important aspect yeah. of our social life. So I think there's an interesting contrast here between the way certain concepts work with, say, within an honor culture where someone has you, been, you need the microphone. Oh, sorry. There's an interesting contrast between the way, say, certain concepts, essential concepts in an honor culture function where someone's been insulted or injured, let's say, and what's important is that that be annulled by uh, some kind of, well, vengeance or something that somehow wipes out. I actually think the notion there is not a normative notion versus the sense of response to injury in the moral sense where when it involves these other things we've just been talking about. Right. Yeah. Uh, just to flag something else that I maybe didn't make clear enough, the, my real interest is in the category normative concepts in the recognition that uh, there can be radically different ones. So maybe honor societies are not societies in which there are any normative concepts. But you can imagine virtue-based societies or duty-based societies or value-based societies where they don't have some of the concepts we have, for instance. Or we lack some concepts that they might have. Or you might think of the D Nietzsche case where there's a genuine normative criticism of the concepts we have and an advocation of some other normative concepts. So I'm trying to figure out, just like the question, what would make a concept a color concept? Whatever particular concepts of colors you have, it's like that. What would make something a normative concept, whatever particular concept of normative features you have in mind, whether honor is a case or not? I've been thinking about sympathy and how, how you would confuse sympathy with ethical thinking. I'm thinking about the people I know who often will break the normative rules because of some instinctive sense uh, of um, know, oneness with the other person. And um, I wondered if you would comment on that. So. I'm going to put aside the wonderful issues of what actually counts as instances of sympathy. Um, there's various different cases of it. And just say, pick your case. And I'm inclined to think the plausible account of what sympathy is, is as a capacity for engagement with others that needn't be mediated by th thoughts about normative conditions. Um, so. In my life, the uh, very vivid case is when my mother passed away, um, I was very upset and for a long time. And my dog clearly sensed it and was immediately solicitous of me when I was in the house, especially when I was showing that I was upset, highly sensitive to it. I think of that as a case of empathy or sympathy. I don't think it's mediated by normative thoughts. And I think there are a lot of people who, against their judgment of what they should do, can't help themselves but act out of sympathy. And other people who act on sympathy without thinking about whether it's justified or right. So I just want to flag that it seems to me an important question because we all know familiar cases of sympathy leading to huge wrongs. Um, it, it's not hard to find, for instance, all sorts of violations of justice that seem best explained by not being able to face the enforcement in a particular case because you're face to face with the person without really having any reason to revise. So I, I like sympathy. I value sympathy. I think it's, you know, using my norm of concepts, I think it's incredibly valuable, but I think it's a separate capacity. Please join me again uh, thanking Professor Sarah McCourt for an illuminating talk. Thank you.